how do you explain that? And how do we explain monitoring? Be successful. So, I mean, uh, you could ask you to correct my rephrasing of it. I'm going to break it down into two really basic. Yeah, but what I, don't, I don't want to say, I don't want to go, why don't people, I don't want to be like, why don't you guys get it? Why don't you guys get my something? Right. That's what I was that's saying. Yeah. yeah. That is kind of, that's what they expect from us right now. It's going to be arrogant. Why don't you guys understand? I'm going to share what I like. have every honest day I guess. Right. So, have we lost something? Let's be honest. Have we lost something? Well, well, I yeah, have we lost something? And if we lost something, what have we lost? And uh, nice what have we gained? What's the big payoff of motion? It's so much easier to build efficiency. It's easier. Thank you very much, says society. Just dumb down and destroy our, our aesthetic experience in the world. I mean, it could get into the greater like, part of the conversation where like, people have yeah. like sculpted things up. You'll see that many things happen. You'll see people who like are masons, so it's like people who like cut stone, that you can make a building like that. It's definitely like it's brought about essentially, so there's not necessarily like your specialized point of respect. The people who make stained glass in these great buildings and people love that, but who's gonna look on stained glass? Well, so yes, and what are the opportunities that that presents to this different? When we do very calm, quiet, some you know, stripped down modernism, and then insert one little flash of aesthetic detail and potential, it has uh, an amplified impact. Okay. This is a strategy for success in the context of people saying, what happened to the art? You know, you give them modern architecture, you quiet down the world, and then you give them one little, one little pop of color and aesthetic quality, and it has the capacity to build people just once. So that's actually an opportunity. It would be that your question is an opportunity for actually really being creating powerful architecture. Bring in an artist for that one percent. Of the project and really have a top. But it is the question of the profession. So we got more. Yeah. And how do we? Emphasize the benefits and reduce the uh, court guards. Can we do court guards buildings? Why not? So that's it. And, and the second one, I think there'll be the second one. Yeah, how to turn suburbs into something sustainable. Uh, how do we, I mean, do we have to bulldoze the suburbs and redo them to so make them work? We have time for that. You have the money for that? Well, it's already too late. It's sorry, it's too late. It, but can you do anything in the, sub, in the suburbs? Can you do anything? They yes, can. we can. <laughs> sorry, I answered. No, we can't. And people are doing it. People have written books. Ellen, Ellen Jones Jones, my colleague from MIT, she has made her career out of how do you build it? Density to the center of suburban centers without having to transform all this single family housing stuff. What's the secret? Uh, creating really? nodes of density at the center of suburbs, where the train stations are. You build on historic patterns. Excuse me. What? <laughs> For 
So what else? You're making it too easy for us. You're supposed to challenge us to give you your money's worth. What do you need from this lecture? Sorry, Robert, I do not understand your laptop. Oh, just uh, exposed my personal life to everybody. <laughs> oh, look what he's into. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> so what, is, what, is what are you looking for? So for the for Google. For Google the, Slides? No, no, for the for the sub you use Safari or Google Chrome. Google Chrome. Yes. Well what are you what are you looking for? The slides? Yeah, the slides. So we're done with the um Why this happened? It went full screen. Um, okay. So is that it? That's all you got for us? We have another one. We have another one. Oh. So every time they click, it opens the dictionary. Oh, yes, don't, don't actually click, just tap. <laughs> This is what it does. I'm just thinking. Yeah. And it's just K. So, what's the context of this question? This is question five. Wait, is it because of the architecture that the UMA is not together? You asked it, right? I can tell. So is that, is it the old? Because like, here like in apartments, we live almost close to But it's not in the But it's not, it's not just a new architecture. Well, here's a question. Do you recognize this phrase? Yeah. Friends don't let friends. <laughs> friends don't let friends. Yeah. That's the new one, right? That's Uma in action. What's Uma? Explain to us what Uma is. It's like a beast band. Do you hear what I'm saying? Stand up and say it. What's Uma? Stand up. Yeah, stand up. We need to hear it. Stand up. Guys, he's, he's talking. So what's the, what's an Uma? What's this Uma thing? So like Uma is I'm Muslim, he's Muslim. It's a count as a brother. Like, like two siblings. So, like, like, that's why I see the like, Arabic language people use the food like, brother of the lot. Right. Because we are the same That person is our brother. They don't like blood. Right. And so, this, this Uma thing and this Islam thing, we should be at a point in the semester in our developments as design professionals to recognize what this is. This is one of those operating systems, isn't it? This is one of those operating systems. And as an operating system, it's a set of under shared understandings at the same time as its architecture. It's a physical infrastructure it reinforces the social understandings. I mean, is that, am I getting that right? Yeah. And this Uma thing where you take care of each other within Islam, you make sure that uh, you're, you're, you're taking care of what is all, in effect, it's your body. Does that sound familiar? It's kind of what, how the studio works, right? In the studio, don't you take care of each other? In the Ummah, you live together, right? In the Islamic communities, yeah. you live close together and you keep an eye on each other, you support each other in a positive way. You're not 
yeah, sometimes it feels like surveillance, but uh, at its core, it's a generous self-care, mutual self-care, right? Sounds like studio to me. I think studio culture is a What do you think? It's not really for a gallery in the gallery. That's a part of it. It's not what it stands for. What is it? What it stands for is like, it isn't looking out, it's like to be connected. To be connected, yeah. Yeah. Well, how is that different from studio culture? You're not as connected. That just makes it a, a, a weaker Uma, which is kind of the core of your question. Yeah. Right? How come the Uma is so weak these days? Is it the architecture? What if Islamic communities were set up like a studio? The Uma, would the Uma be stronger or weaker? Uh. I don't know. I, I think I think the plot is pretty strong. Right, but I don't, my question was like, I feel like we do build support in another state. Right. But I don't think that there's a connection. How about in the studio? The studio, there is. There was a good same station. Yeah. Right. But that's just real, like, day to day. Right. Isn't that more like a day to day? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We pay, we pay, like in Islam, you don't pay to be part of Islam. Well, so I do. But we all pay to be here. Uh, and that connects us. And it's not easy. It's not over what you pay. Right? How you got into the work. You got to get out. We got to help each other or else not everyone's going to make it. That's a pretty strong motivational. So it is an operating system. That is very much physical and architectural because of the studio. I don't know if you can imagine this, but imagine a pandemic happens and you don't have a studio, you're at home on your Zoom screens. Can you imagine that? How does the Yuma work then? How do you get help each other through studio when you're not together in the same room? You don't. Right? Yeah, it's so these operating systems. So architecture is a fundamental component of the success of these operating systems. And it's useful to step outside the familiar and look at something totally alien. I don't know the first thing about Islam. I thought that was something over there, and I never had to know about it. But all of a sudden, why are we talking about it in architecture? Well, it helps us understand complexity. It helps us understand the interplay between architecture and large operating systems. Does that make sense? So I, I'm trying to answer this one. Why do we study Islamic architecture? It's not because I'm going to graduate and become a mosque designer. I probably am not. How many mosques are there? To, what's the market for mosque design? It's actually growing. It's the fastest growing religion in the world, right? Pretty big. Right? So actually, not so unrealistic. So, uh, but that's not why we study it. We're not preparing you for a career in Islamic architectural design. We look at it in the same way we looked at the Roman operating system and Roman grids from last week. That was a complex operating system that depended very directly on the architectural structures for its success. And compared to Islam, the Roman operating system is cartoonishly simple. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you showed slides of David Macaulay's grid. Yep. Yeah. So David Macaulay, the architecture, the second most famous architecture graduate of RISD, um, who never became an architect. Uh, he became a children's book writer, and he made this cartoonishly simple representation of the Roman camp that became the heart of every European city in the Mediterranean world. When you go to Europe, and you will, 
you will walk around and you will amaze your friends by saying, oh yeah, see this in the center of this city, fill in the blank Florence. Uh, Rome, well, Rome, not actually Rome's the exception, but all these cities that were settled by the Romans have this grid at the core of the old city. And you can say, yeah, this is the Roman camp that became the core of the city. You will amaze your friends at how smart you are. I thought you said you've never been here before. Oh, I haven't. Then how do you know so much about the core? I'm an architect. I went to my career. I took that class, right? It's an amazing thing. Now, now that you're good at that, what if things get more complex? If you're trying to decipher complexity in the world, who do you call? The architects. The architects. Because the architects are the ones who look at the world through the lens of the disciplinary tools, these superpowers that you are developing here, especially in Studio 6. You're able to see patterns that other people don't understand. That's why the military will hire you on graduation, help you pay up your student loans, just to have you look at data and identify patterns because you're, you have an architectural training to do patterns on the That's why Wall Street, before they had artificial intelligence, they hired architects to look at tables of numbers and identify patterns so we can get an advanced, slight advantage in the market. If a draft of that, for all the A's get 26, what should be our course of action to get out of that? Should we should we go, hey, we're architects, we can build stuff here, we can look at that up. I like that. Instead uh, of, I died, the, because of the way we work, uh, this is the way to do anything is to the So get a million dollars and drive it out. Yeah, they love for us. Um but pattern recognition is what we do. That's why these two readings make sense together. When we look at, uh, let's go to the slides because this is, we're already into it. This is this one. Slideshow, yeah. I wish I had a clicker. So the, um, so this course, if you didn't go to Wentworth, if you went to name a school that you almost went to. If you went to Rocky Phoenix, Boyd, Arizona online. Phoenix, Arizona online. That's an issue. Which one? MIT. MIT. If you went, well, MIT is the further down. It was close. So MIT is the obvious one, but no, no matter what school you go to, there's a course like this. And nine out of 10 of these courses started out and they're deeply indebted to course, this course that was taught at MIT. So at MIT, David Lynch, not David Lynch, the other one, David Lynch is from the East. By him. Kevin Lynch, the guy who wrote Image of the City. He taught a version of this course uh, for decades at MIT. Then he handed it off to his protege, uh, Julian Meinhardt, who taught it until uh, about 2016, 2012. And then he handed it off to his. No, he didn't hand it off to anyone. He burned all the files, he salted the earth, so no one could ever teach this course again. So at MIT, they had to start off from scratch. But in the meantime, the hundreds of, of students who came through the MIT program since the mid-60s have now scattered across the planet and are teaching versions of that. And it, uh, if you're interested in looking at the roots of this body of, of understanding, Get this book, Kevin Lynch's Theory of Good City Norm. Yes, sir. My uh, is one of the facts for us. It's a uh, personal. He wanted to make sure he was the last one that would teach him. 
No, he wanted to be the final word on this course. He didn't want to hand it off to him. That's and that's in terrifying. Um, so, and look at the little diagrams he puts in the margins. You should connect the dots between these little diagrams he puts in the margins and what we look at with um, Christopher Alexander pattern language and some other things we've been looking at and the diagrams you're producing on Tuesdays and the diagrams you will be producing for the term project, which we will uh, distribute on paper on Tuesday. So when we look at things like this, if you're a normal human being, <clears throat> what comes to mind? Something. Yeah. And chaos, right? Is there a pattern here or is it just random? No pattern. Controlled chaos. That's fair. Does it look like anything we looked at before in this course? Like in the first few weeks of the course? It kind of looks like the informal settlements. It kind of looks like Pathai and North Day, doesn't it? And is, when you look at these informal settlements in the first weeks of the class, we think utter and absolute chaos, right? But then you start to think about the decisions people make as they, uh, they dig into the hillside, make flat places. They start to piece together found materials to make their first version of their house. There are rules. The rules are embedded in social relationships. The rules are embedded in physical reality. Uh, if I live in this house, how do I get to my house? Do I have to sneak through my neighbor's house? Well, well. What do you think? I don't see any streets. I don't see any circulation systems. But this, but then we find out this is an Islamic city. And we know that privacy is kind of the whole shtick. Privacy is at the core of the DNA of the Islamic city. You need to have privacy. That's the basis of being a good Muslim, is having privacy. So you know that there are circulation systems that connect uh, from whatever the central elements of this are into every single courtyard house in the system. And you start to see the courtyards that every one of these uh, cells has a courtyard around which the rooms of the house are arranged. And again, that's to create privacy. And so as we go through these things, we use, we develop our architectural skills uh, to understand that there's an interplay between the operating system, the rules of behavior as a Muslim, and the physical fabric that uh, is produced by those rules and in turn reproduces those behaviors. So in the 20th century, we're, we were in the bad habit of thinking only in terms of cause and effect. It's a one directional thing that this causes that. Architecture is the outcome of some force. Wealth or capitalism produces this architecture and then the cycle stops. But we can't afford to think that way anymore. Here in the 21st century, because of the challenges we face, not just as architects, but as a society, we are compelled to, to think more clearly about the oscillation, the reciprocal relationship between cause and effect. The rules of Islam create the housing. The housing reinforces, reproduces, and strengthens the rules of Islam. It's both. The rules of capitalism create the architecture of our cities. The architecture of our cities is an instrument for reproducing the system of capitalism. Both are true. The Roman uh, city core that we looked at last week is the direct outcome of this Roman strategy for expanding its empire 
At the same time, every time uh, a new Roman settlement is produced by that system, it then reproduces a new uh, battalion of centurions who get sent off to the next town to conquer it and to establish the next. It's like a pyramid scheme. It's not just cause and effect. It's a reciprocal relationship between the forces of this operating system and the physical infrastructures of architecture. And once we get that understanding, uh, we, un we start to understand how these operating systems proliferate and cover the planet. And you also have an insight into every project that you do as an architect it is part of this larger cyclical operation of operating systems and the architectural infrastructures that produce it. So if we were to quickly look at the operating system of Islam, what are the core principles of Islam? that are reproduced, reinforced in the physical infrastructures of architecture, and that then reinforce those operating principles. Sir? Daily prayer. Daily prayer. How many times? Five times, any time you want? Yeah. No. Specific. Specific times. What times? So up, so down. Four down. Four down. Crazy early. Noon. Midday. Wait, is that noon? No, like noon. 12, 1. So noon, and then solar noon. So two different noons. One's lock noon, one's solar noon. Dusk. Sunset. Sunset. Red night. Yeah. How do you keep track of that? It's like bird, it's birded. Well, well now you have an asset, right? Yeah, well, before, it was... before, how did you do it? So, there's a call for prayer. There's a call for prayer. Oh. Right? I can't hear it. Even though it's right there, right? it's right across the street. Largest mosque in New England. Right across the street from one. I can't hear it. So, I used my app. But before I had an app, and even if I can't hear the call of prayer, I have my, my buddies. Friends don't let friends miss call of prayer, right? And then do you have to go to the mosque to pray? No. No. Where do you go? Anywhere clean. Hmm? Anywhere clean. Anywhere that's clean. Outside. Outside, inside, here at Wentworth. It's supposed to be that room downstairs where we can pray. But oh, it should be like very loud. It should be do you bring, bring your own prayer right? It's good. But there's all these people napping in What's that? They already try to use it. Wait, what? People take naps in there. And eat whatever. Down down the ground floor of the bay. Do we have prayer in prayers going on there? Okay. And you face anywhere you want. You face this this bad boy. Right here. Right. Right. So it's so important to figure out how to pray, prop, pray properly five times a day that Islam is the reason we know that the world is round long before Columbus. It's because the, the sciences around, uh, the sciences that are supported by Islamic universities, while Europe was in the Dark Ages, Islam is thriving and keeping the sciences alive. First, uh, maps of the stars are all coming out of Islamic universities. Uh, so what else? That's prayer. There's five things you need to do as a Muslim. Pray five times a day. What's the other four? You, if you can afford it, you do the pilgrimage to Mecca once in your lifetime. Have you done it yet? Who's done it? All right. Twice, but you're gonna okay. So you go to Mecca. What's number three? Charity, charity. zakat. Is that what we call it? Yeah. So charity. How much do we have to give? How much? Two point five of your unused, your discretionary wealth. 
2.5%. I could do that. That's not that much. I give that much bank fees, right? Do I pay bank fees in my Islamic bank? No, right? No interest charges. That would be wrong. That'd be cool. If I, if I could open an account in a Sharia bank, I would do that be much cheaper. Is there one? Yeah. Uh, I need one with a local branch. Okay, that's three. What's number four? Fasting. Fasting. How long do I have to fast? Okay, but during Ramadan, how long is Ramadan? A month. A month? I can't fast for a month. Humans die. I can't, I'm not, what? What? Sunrise. Oh, I only fast between sunrise and sunset? Yeah. Okay. How do I remember to do that? What if I'm really hungry? What? It's tied to the prayers. It's tied to the prayers, yeah. And you break the fast at sunset. Okay. And we have a big party. So again, I'm dependent on my buddies. Friends don't let friends break the fast before sunset. What's the fifth one? What is it? Saying, uh, like, your, your proclaiming your belief. So proclaiming your belief. There's only one God and Allah is his name. Yeah, and Muhammad is his prophet. Okay. All right. So it's a pretty demanding operating system, but it depends on the physical form of the architecture for its functioning. And so the complexity of these patterns in architecture, this is uh, the connection to uh, the natural world and biomimicry. Like what's going on here? And what's going on here? Starlings. What are the rules? Like you're architects, right? Yeah, if you're trying to figure out why, how does this work? Who are you gonna call? Okay. That's right, you call the architects. You want the architects to say, architects, how, how does this work? Hey. This is this parametric? Is it parametric? Okay. Is it parametric? What do you think? A bird's grasshopper? If you were an engineer, you studied engineering before architecture. If you're an engineer, what would you say? You'd probably say, oh, there's probably a control bird. And the control bird is telling all the other birds what to do. So that's how engineers solve the problems. That's the engineering Maybe the program, what's the program? Uh, what's the operating system? The operating system would be like, oh, <laughs> when we get to autonomous vehicles, what's the strategy that it's going to work? So we have one control point control, one air traffic controller, controls in motion. Yeah, where do you, what's a high one? Yeah, yeah. Everybody agrees. Or they don't have to agree. So uh, computer scientists test out these ideas with drones. They program the drones. They say, okay, drone, when the drone next to you, well, first thing they say is avoid being on the edge. The first line of code is, if you're on the edge, move to the center. Because if you're on the edge, you're gonna get killed, right? A predator is gonna come and get you. So if you're on the first line of code, move to the center. It's like the five precepts of Islam. Now it's five lines of code being a bird. What's the operating system of being a bird that explains this complex behavior?
Rule number one, if you're at the edge, move to the center. Rule number two, if the bird next to you gets too close, uh, move farther away. But there's a bit of a delay now. And then they're doing this at dusk. And they're, they're swarming over cities of Europe in greater numbers because of climate change. And they're leaving a lot of uh, excrement all over the cities of Europe. So there's a question, what do we do? So you might get a call. They might call the architects and say, what do we do about this? And so here's some clues. Um, at dusk, they're looking for a place to land. And is there a kingbird that's deciding Where's a good place to land for the night? No, it's whoever, whichever bird uh, identifies a place that might be good to land, they move in that direction. If another bird follows them, then now you've got two birds going in one direction, and you've got the start of a shared motion. And once a majority of birds are moving in the direction of that landing spot, then the decision is basically been made. Everyone conforms to it, but if if the if you don't get a critical mass of birds heading to that one place, then you you end up moving back away, and you end up with these waves. So that's three lines of code that result in extreme comp complexity in the larger operation of the operating system. So these are the kinds of things that we refer to as emergent form. And there are emergent uh, patterns that are baked into these simple lines of code. This is uh, the sculptor Andrew Goldsworthy, and he goes for walks and he sits quietly in nature. And have you seen this stuff before? So he sits quietly in nature and he just observes and he's looking for a rule. Uh, he noticed there's lots of leaves, and he starts to collect leaves, and then he categorizes the leaves in terms of size, shape, uh, the spectrum from brown to yellow. And then he creates these beautiful uh, assemblies according to certain principles of moving from brown to yellow, from large to small. Uh, and he creates things like this. He collects the icicles, and then he melts it with his fingers, and they fuse together, and he hangs it from the tree. He uh, weaves sticks together in the pond, and he builds stone walls in the forest. And basically, he's doing something like what we do. He's looking for the details of architecture. He's looking for the small-scale forces, and he's uh, leveraging those small-scale forces that he can see because he's an artist, and he's building on those principles to create a larger assembly that results in a, a form that, did he have these forms in mind when he started melting things together? No, it emerged out of the forces themselves that are basically at the core of nature. Islamic city, what's going on here? Complete chaos at first glance, but then you see patterns. You notice uh, if, I, if I could get rid of the screen and start highlighting as if I'm in Photoshop, I would start to see patterns of courtyards at the core of every house. I would see uh, circulation paths that cut between the houses. I would notice these fissures of domes that form between the houses. Uh, these are the market streets. I would see larger things um, that are slightly tweaked in relationship to other things around it. And we know what that is. When you see a larger building that's tweaked in relationship to the things around it, David McCauley, once again, what is that larger thing that's tweaked in relationship to the fabric around it? It's the mosque, because why? Because at the core of the operating system of Islam is prayer uh, directed towards the Kaaba in the center of the city of Mecca. And so 
you can decode. You can amaze your friends when you go visit Istanbul uh, with your friends. You can amaze them if they're not architects and didn't take this class. You can say, oh yeah, I see that's a mosque. How do you know? And it does its tweet. But you can say, I'm, I'm an architect. I know these things. And there's uh, a men's, a young, a boys' school, a madrasa, and a market. And there are physical configurations that um, are based in the inherited traditions. So there's the, the twisting of the mosque so that it faces neck up. The major say, um, I mean, is that, is that what you call it, major say? Mendoza. Mendoza. It was called a madrasa in where I lived. Almost the same as Yeah. So it's a boys school because why? Others, oh, it's, it's co ed? Yeah, definitely. It depends where you go. The word, the word means school. Yeah. Um, but friends don't let friends, their young men, get in trouble. Because what do young men do? Sorry, young men. You get, you get in trouble. Right? So friends don't let friends get in trouble. They go to the madrasa where they can keep an eye on each other. Um, and then there's a place where the imam, the, what do we call the imam in English? Imam. Yeah. And then there's the haman, which, what is that? And why is that important in Islam? You need to wash before you pray. A very specific sequence to ensure cleanliness. So these baths are actually sacred locations. And wherever Islam goes in the world, it, well, originally, wherever Islam goes in the world, it embraces the cultural practices of that location, including or especially the architecture. If there's a Roman tradition of architecture, Islam embraces that Roman tradition of architecture and incorporates the building systems into the, uh, its systems, and you create uh, masonry arched, uh, vaulted, and dome structures uh, as the core architectural vocabulary of Islam. When it goes to Northern Africa, what's the architectural form? I don't think I have slides of this, but it's mud, it's hand, hand sculpted mud structures that are renewed every season. When it goes to Southeast Asia, uh, it becomes uh, the four, the square uh, peak roof uh, mosque form of, throughout Southeast Asia that used to be a Hindu form. So there are specific ways of drawing uh, that it's worth looking at that came out of uh, the uh, the architecture school at Columbia uh, and a scholar by the name of Klaus Herdeg took his students to these different cities of uh, Central Asia and did these fantastic drawings of specific Islamic city fabrics. And because uh, the system is so dependent on domed and vaulted structures, they developed a way of drawing uh, from below. So these are worms eye view drawings that are produced because this is the best way to capture the, the architectural brilliance of these series of domed structures is to look at it from below. Do you see it? It's uh, sometimes called a worm's eye view. You look up and you see the underside of the domes from underground just turn the ground uh, transparent because we're architects, we can do that. And imagine what it would be like to be a worm looking up through a transparent earth into the underside of the domes. But ways of drawing that are necessitated by the architecture itself.
So we don't have time to get into all the cities of Islam that would be interesting. Um, sometimes courses are taught on that. Um, but we look at the influence. In sophomore studio, we used to give you guys, instead of the, what did you do, the antiquarian bookstore? Yes. So instead of those projects, we used to give you a courtyard house. And the reason we gave you a courtyard house for the students who came before you was to disrupt this idea that is at the core of United States culture, which is if you have a parcel and uh, access by automobile, um, this is this is the building. It's the um, the empty space, which is like the empty frontier of the wilderness of North America, spreading from sea to shining sea. Uh, and then the cabin in the woods in the center of the fence enclave. This is the cultural model of the operating system that is dominant in the United States. But if you take the same thing uh, in a lot of other places in the world, especially in the Islamic world, and you have the opposite. Because of the requirements of privacy, it makes no sense to have a house like this because you have windows that look into each other. And then, so all of a sudden, you have two different families with windows and you can see across the space and see into someone else's house. This is the result of the logic of privacy, where when I look out my window, I'm seeing uh, across the courtyard to my own family's comfort. So privacy is maintained. And Any, I have to add there, there is also a, a requirement of connection with the sky, the cost. Okay. Because with the corridor, you connect more, it's a vertical connection to the sky. Yeah, that's uh, cool. While the while the cabin in the wood is the horizontal connection to the terminal. Right. So and that is a completely different mindset. Right. And so the mindset, is embedded in the architectural form, which reinforces the mindset. You see, it's a reciprocal relationship. It goes back and forth. And the architecture reproduces the mindset. And so that's the way to think about our architecture. And looking at very strange things that are unfamiliar to us helps us develop those muscles and those skills. Um, Jeffrey Bawa uh, did this house in Sri Lanka. Uh, that it's not a Muslim house. He's not Muslim. Uh, he wasn't Muslim. But it uses the same idea of every room opens onto one or two courtyard spaces that are open to the sky. And it's really this rich experience of whenever you walk into a room, you're basically walking into a room adjacent to this private garden that makes the room work. And so you are able to blur the boundaries between inside and outside. The only thing separating the inside and the outside is the moss, in this case, and the fact that there are doors that can close during the monsoon rains. This is an example in Kuwait of what happened when they got rid of that. And I think I want to pass the baton on, on this note that uh, really back uh, at this slide, that this capacity that we've been developing the whole semester of looking at architecture and reading in architectural form, reading a set of forces that are underlying the architectural form. In Studio Six, the forces are gravity, fluids, air flows, circulation of humans. It's very clear forces that are involved in the formation of the architecture of Studio Six. But we don't want you to forget that there are other social forces uh, of these operating systems, of the Roman operating system, capitalism as an operating system systems of oppression 
extractive capitalism specifically as an operating system. And once you read the operation of systems and forces in the architecture, you are no longer enslaved to reproducing those systems. You can actually do what clients expect us to do, is to tweak the code of the physical component of the operating system so that we can produce better outcomes. And that extends to uh, the issues of climate justice and being able to read uh, in natural systems, how do natural systems work? And if we understand how natural systems work, can we take that understanding of natural systems and embed them at the core in the DNA the way Andrew Goldsworthy does of our physical architectural systems? So that's, I think, yeah. where I want to pass the time. So, tagging you in. Yeah. So, thank you. Okay, so I, I after listening Robert, by the way, who, who had a chance to read the bio me me Okay, great. So I, I want to start with a philosophy. Called Jose, he's from Spain, called Jose Ortega y Gasset. So, do you know that guy? This is one guy, there are no two, this is one guy, Jose Ortega y Gasset. So, he, he said something that is, that is closely related to what Robert was saying. He said that in so humans, we, we, we in our civilizations, we create, we use technology to create a new culture, and these cultures become the new nature. And he called that over nature. So this over nature is the new nature that we believe that is, and, and we take everything that is below that over nature as branded. So let me give you an example. When you go to the to the to your bathroom and you open the faucet, it's not going to water. It's natural for you that you have water there. But it's not natural. There are a lot of things that need to happen in order to make that water come to your faucet. And so we are constantly building technologies on top of technologies on top of technology, and we suddenly forget where we come from. So we suddenly forget that there is a na natural conditions that are at the bottom of these many, many layers that we are creating, and we are, because we are creating natures over natures over natures over natures. We have an over naturalization of the world. So close to the philosophical thing. You follow me there? So we're, 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 what we're trying to do here is to understand, because biomimicry, if you've read the reading, is how we can mimic the bio. How it's very simple. So the concept is it's, it's, it's extremely simple. It's how we can read the nap, the bio. It's basically a field, and this is the structure from the reading. You have time to read that. It's, so it's, it's a new technology that instead of create a new over nature, over, over, the, over the nature, it's a new technology that emulates the natural environment to solve problems. Or uh, human problems. So we're basically trying to understand or to read or to and to and to, uh, to decodify the systems of the natural environments to use and use that to solve human problems. So actually, this is exactly what the words bears were doing in in Robert's video, and this is exactly what what. Uh, informal sediments were doing. They're basically emulating this, the natural, and they were doing that naturally. Um, so, I'm sorry. So, is this the last one? Sorry, give me one second. Did you download that, Robert? Okay. 
Yeah. So so what I what, what I what I'm trying to do here as an experiment is is that in architecture we also mimic things. We try to see things and see how architecture uh, how this it's a reference or a precedent to create new things. So we do things like that. We we look things in the world like fish. We create architecture. Do you recognize this building? This is Frank Gehry. He's trying to emulate a fish to create this beautiful uh, canopy in Barceloneta, in Barcelona, Spain. It's a beautiful canopy at the end of the of the of the um, uh, of the fish. Uh, but also, you can do this, which is basically the emulation of the of the fish. Please, let, let's let's have a boat here. So, so you can you can you can imagine the nature, and you can biomimic the nature, or biomimic the nature. So, okay, let's have a vote. Who who prefer this one? Raise your hand. Some of you. I and you gave. I can feel you. <laughs> who prefer this one? Okay. <laughs> Why? No, no, you don't have to discuss. So some. So my, my what I'm thinking of here is that so we are so with biomimic we can we can uh, uh, we have different ways to biomimic the world and but if we connect this with the but, but at the end we can do better my point is that we can do better than that because we can do we can understand not only the form of the fish but the systemic relations that operates in the fish relationship. We are in urbanism. We're trying to think about these relations. So we want to come back to our notion of urban ecology. So this is the first class where we were discussing about climate justice. I don't know if you remember that we, some of you opened Google. I don't know who said that. I think it was you, Connor. But you opened Google. That was week 11 that in our, in, in Robert's frame, and it's not the last week, but the first one, you know, week 11. So in week 11, we, 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 some of you open Google and you discovered that ecology is the branch of biology, and I would say of urbanism, that deals with the relationship between, with the relationship between, between organism, which means human beings, to another and their physical surroundings. It means the city. So urban ecology is basically the relationship between us and the city. My question here is how we connect this idea of ecology that we discussed with the idea of biomimic. Bio, biomimicry. So how we can emulate not only the fish as a form, but also the systemic relations that, that we create in this urban ecology. And, and the question here is, if, do, if we are observers of the nature or we are part of the natural system? Because the notion of ecology what says that we are not seeing persons who, who see the natural environment, but we belong to the natural system. Everything that we use is also natural. We're part, we're a systemic part of this ecological thinking. So and this comes with these two books that I, uh, I, I, I try to quote this book, but there are too many things. Actually, if you try to read the production of the space of the paper, it's amazing because every single paragraph is a quote. And you can it's a very, very amazing complex mix. But especially Neil Smith, he creates, he built on top of the known logic of the project of the space. Actually, this guy, Henry Lefebvre, guys, was the man, the, the, the scholar, created the notion of the right to see that we were discussing in the second week, with technique, I mean. So he created this idea of the production of the space that is basically understanding that the space is not, it's not only an, an, a place where we are. It's also the space that determines what, what we are. So we are not building a space, it's also the space built us. So there is a social production of the space. Every time that we create a space, the form that this space is reflects us, and I go back to this example. So the form that this cabinet is frame us, and we are framing the cabinet as well. And so we are a type of person here and a type of person here. There is a production of the space, a social and human production of the space. Are we following this? So in the same with the same idea, Neil Smith uh, in this book about climate 
justice, he creates a chapter called the production of nature. So we are producing nature. And the way we produce nature, produce the society that we have. So we, we, last week we were discussing about how we transform the territory doing extensive grids across whole, the whole United States. The way we produce these extensions create this notion that we believe that we can dominate it. So we, there is a constant relation between us and the space. My question here is, be careful with, with the biomimicry. Because in some ways we can replicate nature. But at the same time, this natural system is created by us. So we can also repeat the uh, structural inequalities that we were discussing uh, previous weeks. But in any case, what I'm trying to say here is that natural is not something that is outside of us. So this is a natural thinking in the 16th, 17th, 17th century, where we believe that the natural is something that is there. And we're here as humans, and we can dominate that because we do not belong to the natural system. So what I'm trying to communicate here is that we are also not in the natural system. We are there. We belong to there. We belong to the colleges, and we shape the colleges, and the colleges is shaping us constantly. So, and that comes with the idea of 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 of, of this guy, Timothy Morton, that he tries to move away of this romantic feeling or perspective of the of the nature. He said that we can have he said that we can have like an ecology without natural nature. So what he basically says is that the way we build the space and the way we build public space in cities is also natural. That is also natural. So every time that we put a single brick in a street, we're doing a natural environment. Because everything is natural. And if we understand this, we understand that that brick will affect the ecosystem across the world. And this is Timothy Morton. So the, co the, concept, the concept of nature is, 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 is not something that we see from a mirror and from, outside, and, and from, 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 from a vitrine, but something where, where we belong and where he's trying is to break these uh, 19th century notion of the division between the rural, the rural and the urban. So what, what we are trying to say is that there is no anymore, there is no division anymore about the rural and the urban. And this is important point because what is happening now is that we believe that we, we design something what we call the urban or the city. So we are we have to design for the city. And only when we design in, in the country side, we have to take care of our networks. So where the name. But, but they are trying to say that we have to you know, start blurring the boundaries between the urban and the rural and understanding that everything is fluid, especially in the, how, because natural happens everywhere. So this is a, uh, a cartoon by one very, very famous cartoonist from Argentina. Do I have Argentinians here? No, not here. I have an, uh, a person from Argentina in the studio, but she's... So, so I, I, I try my best translation of this. He says, we continue building the destruction of the future. Please forgive the inconveniences. So this is the consequence of this division between the natural system and the human made system. Because we believe that we can build whatever and we can we don't have to respect the nat nature if we're not building on top of it. So uh, because at the end everything is connected and it comes, we have to talk now about planetary urbanism. So planetary urbanism is a concept built by Professor Neil Brenner. Uh, currently at uh, New University of Chicago. He basically worked on top of Walter Saller and the Oxyarmis, uh, this very amazing uh, Greek architect. They say that the whole, and I don't know if they said that in one of my before, and Robert also said that, is we are living in a world that is completely urbanized. Everything is urban. The bottom of the sea is urbanized. So we have cables, to 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 transfer Wi-Fi from one company to the other, so everything is organized. Which means that doesn't mean that everything everything is a city, city. but the urban systems, the urban as a process, is spread out of, across the whole territory because we built, we urbanized the the whole world, and that was said by Constantinos Dioxiades in 1962. 
This is not a new idea. So even if in 1962, Constantine created this very famous map about the urbanized world. So we we now still believe in that there is a, a, a division between the, between the na nature and us. So we don't keep, need to include natural-based solutions in our projects. So everything is fluid, everything is natural. But there is another branch, and I, 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 I take this slide from week 11, that there are many brands like Spatial Justice, Sustainable Development, Ecological Urbanism, Ecological Restoration, Plow Scapes, Waste, Landscape, Landscape of Urbanism, Landscape is trying to understand how we can design with and for the name future. There is something that we are trying to do today, uh, after discussing, and this is just by Robert, is, is, to, is to try to intersect this discussion with some practical ideas that you can apply in your in your courses. Actually, we are having two, two, two class left, this one and the next one. In both classes, we will be giving you certain tools that you can apply. I hope we hope you can apply it during this video session. So this is so I hope that if you are uh, if you are not completely awake today you can come back to these slides at the beginning of the next semester because I'm pretty sure that you can use some of these uh, ideas for your projects uh, next semester. So the next idea, the, the, the next of my presentation is based in this catalog that I strongly suggest you to read. If you go to the to the to the slides and you click this link, you can download the, this catalog of not nature-based solutions for urban resilience and designed very recent, 2021 by the World Bank. And it's, it's a great book that basically compiles uh, many ideas about how we can integrate natural-based solutions, not in the countryside, not in the Amazon, but inside, uh, inside the city. So he start with this diagram. So uh, um, that basically, uh, have, it's a process that includes processes, functions as benefits for people, and how the processes of including natural based solutions create some functions of, of natural of, na of, of natural system regulations that will be beneficial for the for the public. And usually this is a cycle because you can create an ecosystem that, that modify ecosystem to create new ecosystems. So these three phases create Tons of items that you can apply in your project. You can have processes like biodiversification, on infiltration, of cooling effects, of permeability of the soil, of creating shade and protects from the uh, from the heat. You have functions that has the elements that you design, like heat regulation. You can have coastal flow regulations to. Uh, you can have things like biodiversification or, or soil pollution regulations. So you have functions of the elements that you design. And finally, you have the benefits. And the benefits are So one of the things that, that happened with this catalog is this catalog is like forever. It's not a comprehensive thing that you can have everything there. It's, it's a, you can imagine that you can add a new icon every moment that you design a new product. So, but in the end, you can have you, have, you can have the benefit of cultural reproduction, uh, biodiversification, education, or social engagement and interaction. But if something that is great of this catalog is that they are highly including people as form of, of these ecosystems. So they create this method where you can use the functions of the benefits and in, a, in any specific project that are mine the amounts of, 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 of rain flood regulation that you're doing or the amount of air pollution regulation that you're doing. And even if you're not doing all of that in your projects, you can use this framework to, to at least assess the amount of, of mm, ecological thinking that that, that that project has or not. So, and the other thing that is very, very interesting with the catalog, the catalog is that is the capital divides the ecosystems into different types. 
because it's not the system, and it's a system during a forest, an urban forest, that if you are in a in a in a in a, uh, in a city that is in front of the sea the, of the ocean. So they have different ecosystems. And they use he used this idea of the of the section valley. So from coastal cities, delta cities, river cities, and mountain cities, and how these valley sections create different ecosystem, ecosystems that have different possible natural-based uh, solutions. And this is closely related to this diagram that I showed you in week 11 as well, is, is the valley section by Sir Patrick Geddes in 1915. So I'm saying that because it seems that sustainability is a new thing. It seems that ecologic uh, environmental action is a new thing. It seems that 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 uh, that we were to, talking something new because of climate change. But in 1950, Patrick Geddes said that the valley section is something important to understand the city. The view. So this, uh, guys, Robert asked you what what would be your top one uh, uh, city uh, university that you want to study. I have to say that in any course of urbanism in the world. They are showing this section because this section is like like the beginning of ecological thinking. So you have to remember that if you have to if, if you have to say somewhere that you you were in the course. So this section basically says that the, that the human has different ecosystems from the mountains to the water, but also it has different tools on labors. You have different tools depending on the ecosystem, and you have deep, sorry different tools and different labors. So what this, what Sir Patrick Geddes was trying to say, that there is a close connection between labor, production, the tools that we use, and the type of ecosystem we are. So the, and I come back again to the idea of the production of the nature, the production of the space. The ecosystems creates our economics, uh, operational system, and vice versa. So, but what is what is fun for me is that. The natural-based solutions by the World Bank built in uh, design or created in 2021 use, use the same framework of, of Patrick Geddes uh, 100 years before. So, yeah, so they have this. Oh, sorry, this is blue. I'm so sorry, okay? Uh, something happened when I transferred that from Photoshop. So basically, they build these sections where they create, for example, a valley section from the from the mountain to valley to the to the water. And you can have different uh, processes like artificial reefs or different um, functions like artificial reefs, mangroves, forests, sandy shores, natural inland winds or river flood vents. And depending on different ecosystems, you will generate different forms of, of natural based solutions. So and they also have that for the for the scale of the neighborhoods and how you have, for example, water management from the roof of the building to the bottom of the street. Or also you have different natural-based solutions on the scale of the street. So you can open the catalog and look at and connect these sections with the icons that I showed before and how you can have infiltration, salt cleaning, water, water collection and change at the scale of the street. And again, I'm using the gate the metaphor of Neo from the Matrix. If you are a good architect, you have to recognize not only that you have that street, but all of these opportunities of, of, of natural-based solutions that you have in this, in this project. And finally, in, this, in the catalog, they divide the ecosystem in many of them. I just select my favorite ones. I select 11, which is a lot. But you have different forms of ecosystems and different and possible natural nature-based solutions. How do you integrate these functions of, 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 of natural incorporation of remediation and depending if you're in a floodplains or in an urban farming or, the, or a building solution? So now, any questions so far? Okay, what we'll do now is I have 20 minutes to show you 11 case studies, contemporary case studies, good examples about how different Architects oh, are, have been incorporating nature within the cities to have environmental actions, positive actions to address climate justice. So and to and to integrate 
the nature as an example of 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 of, of design of the of cities of cities design. So I'm gonna use from urban forest to mangroves uh, with eleven examples. So fasten your seat belts again. That will be um, that will be fast. So we have we can have urban forest. So it's basically imagining that you can integrate the logic of the ecosystemic forest within the city. Uh, this is Utrecht. Uh, it's a street, but what is really, really amazing of this street in Utrecht built two years ago is, is that the, the street is not the traditional fancy trees that we, that decorates this, the, the, the street, but also it's a forest itself. And it's beautiful, to, and you have certain areas that also have biggest forest inside, but it's beautiful to see that you have in any daily base, uh, people living in that city picking apples in front of the street because the forest is integrated with the urban environment. So they did that uh, with, it's an urban agriculture, and this is another new framework, it's, at least it's new for me. So I am in my 50s. So when I when I study architecture, we have urban projects and agriculture. We never imagined that they could be together. Today, we can imagine that you can have agricultural activities within the city. Why not? If you talk with something that or someone that thinks only from cause and effects reaction, they, they will say it's impossible to to deal with urban with the uh, I don't know with food with urban agriculture. We don't have the amount of land that we have in the cities to feed the whole population of that city. That's the reason we need to have agricultural side. But we are, but they are not saying that this urban agriculture also produces other benefits that are not only the food, it's, it's the human engagement with the nature. It's the awareness, a cultural awareness about what the importance of being close to nature. So this project also is a beautiful combination between human a landscape and 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 it's great doing uh, uh, water management. These are some of the original drawings built by Felix. It's a it's this firm in Utrecht that built participatory design projects to integrate some idea, especially for the kids, in the way where the, the they design city and that. And for that, they come with the, they come with this solution of this uh, pathway that goes. On top of the of the nature to enjoy how to to enjoy the the trees from different uh, uh, perspectives. The second one is a uh, is dealing with the slopes. This is a project for an amazing firm of architecture called RF Architecture Ecology and Participation <laughs> in Caracas. So so this is Petare, and they this thing what basically what they did is to understand that informal settlements in Caracas. Happen in the slopes, and how communities deal with deal with these slopes help them to the reframing the projects. So, for example, in this case, do you, you understand that the, the houses are building gradually one house on top of the other to create uh, these uh, to, to create these platforms of houses one on top of the other, or they can find moments of horizontality to create human connections, even if you have a small pathway. So understanding or reading these patterns that happens in the formal settlement, they built a project that is basically, was basically the connection between one old house transformed now in the, into a cultural center to, uh, with the, the formal settlement through a set of, of gardens that are built that, that move horizontally from bottom to top. And these gardens, and then you have a, ramp, a system of ramps that move horizontally. So it's basically understanding how slopes is not an enemy, but it's an, it's an opportunity to create vertical gardens and terraces the, uh, for, for, for community engagement. So you see here how the ramps move on, from top to creating these gardens uh, in a place that, that where gardens doesn't exist in the middle of an informal center. This is fully on Blanco in Petare Norte. I know that. I, 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 I invite you to go to the Google slide of week 11. The first slide that you showed in this class was the output of this class. Yes. 
one of my favorite. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if you see, they are ecological, which means uh, retaining walls where you can plant, where you can the eucalyptus planting with vertical gardens to use slopes as a form, not only to, to, uh, to stabilization of the land, but also to creating a local economy and a, and a local engagement. Third, water courses. So there is a new trend of water courses. So in the past, because of the thing that we were discussing last week, last week we were discussing about how the grid builds in a center, in a dry plain, and they ignore what is happening around. So commonly, rivers, water courses were neglected for, for the backyard of their cities. So most of the city, and also it's the place where this is the scales and pirates. You know, it's, the rivers are where the enemies. So most of the cities, the rivers are the, the backyard of the city. So, but in many places, so, and that's the reason that we have a lot of highways in the city, sorry, rivers, because there are empty spaces, neglected areas that were not built for a while because they were uh, pieces that, that, that pieces that were in the backyard of the city. So, but there are many, a trend now of transformation of cities into, sorry, of rivers into new, ecosystems, including natural-based solutions inside the city. This is Seoul. This is a very famous project that have won a lot of tons of, of, of prizes and uh, international awards. So basically, they so this is the before and after of the section. You will be, have to do a lot of sections in, in Studio 7, so please take a look at this one. But this is the before and after. This is how these type of, of uses happens before and after of this section. You can see that most of the area were a highway. And now they're trying to divide that into different forms of mobility, uh, but also a lot of porosity in the way they treat the soil. So this happens across the whole the, the, the whole valley. And, and they have a new river where you can see the water. This is a and new principles for water management and natural based solutions is that you open the rivers. You want to see the river. You don't hide them anymore. So there are, because you connect the social and human um, uh, stewardships as a part of the problem. So people can see what is happening with the river. If you will have a flood, you will understand uh, uh, easily, or you can remedy that easily if you are seeing that flood. Uh, you can create alarms across the community of happen. This is another beautiful image because they have these ruins of the old highways as part of the of the landscape of the of this project. So there is a lot of uh, art also involved in the in a, in a, in a project that is highly porous. So I love I, I love that the porosity of the soil allows also the water to run to run not only in the river also in underground filtering uh, towards the soil. If, if I have one critique of this project, I, I would say is, I'm sorry, let me go back. If I want critique of this project is these huge uh, retaining walls that was part of the heritage of the, uh, of the previous highway, so that in some ways isolate this bottom part from the top one. So there is a huge distance here. There is, is, is quite evident in that section. And, that, and, and that's the reason because they had to do this type of artistic intervention to have a better, uh, uh, an appealing form or appealing perspective of, 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 this, of this view. Third option, buildings. So building projects are a new form of introducing natural solutions. So one of the big solutions, you know, that is green roof. Who are doing green roof in your project? Some of you. So green roof is being a new trend to, to integrate cities in the, in the uh, uh, natural based solutions in natural solutions in the city. So this is a project from Masanti. You know who is Masanti? It's, a, it's the same team of architects who built Biblioteca España in Medellin. King of Spain Library. The King of Spain Library. Wow. So that was the same team. He created that this building to connect that with strong infrastructure to use this park to connect that fragment of the city, the fabric 
to this old part previously disconnected by this highway. So uh, and this is in Bogota, Colombia. So and 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 the other the other thing that is beautiful in this project is that it has a nice balance between hardscape and softscape solution. And this is something that you have. I want to highlight because so if, And I, I can highlight that criticizing Boston. Boston is a city that has amazing parks. I always say that. We have an amazing, amazing park, but we have few hardscape, few square, few plus. I cannot even remember one. Every time that we have one space, like a couple of square, we fill that with brass and things. So we are always afraid to have open areas. And open areas are very important for people to gather. To celebrate or to protest. So, so this this project is a nice balance between areas that are hardscape where you can gather with the community to create a, you know, a social ecology with with your mates, but also have areas where there are more green, where 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 water can permeate and where the permaculture can happen here. So next next semester. If you are in in in, in, or in concentration urbanism, to followed by Professor Kelly Hudson, she will ask you to do an assignment about what she called blue infrastructure or green infrastructure. So when you are there, you will have here a lot of references that you can use for that class. So again, I'm saving some time from 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 your next semester. So. So this is the project. Obviously, this is a this is a sound for the place. Uh, not. So the beauty of this, of this project, you can imagine the birds as part of the ecosystem, but the two guys drinking coffee and walking around as part of the ecosystem. Well, and how they can work and live together. So I have a professor. I already see that he asked me how many people live in Boston. You can say how many people how many have people are three million inhabitants. We have thirty. We have uh, uh, squirrels. We have insects. They are also inhabitants of others. They all go for some. So we understand that they're not only at the street. But are only alone, you can understand that these ecosystems are also part of the city and should be part of the city. Okay, green spaces, number five, there are 11. So, number five is understanding that we can create the greens inside the city. This is an amazing project, NF7 and Architects in Bangkok. So they have different uh, uh, functions of natural big solutions like green roofs, the detention loans, the spaces where you retain the water uh, or constructed wetlands. Usually wetlands are natural. You can have built a wetlands and a wetland are very useful for, for climate change adaptation, not, not or remediation, not mitigation, but adaptation where you have areas where the floods goes to avoid the floods goes to where places where you don't want to be. So you retain the water in some places. And that also creates certain areas for classrooms that are outdoor classrooms. And then you want, I'm building with these four functions of, of, of natural based solutions. They create these beautiful projects combining all of these together. Number six, it's a green street or green corridors. And this comes with a huge branch that I want you, to, I invite you to investigate that is TOD, Transit Oriented Development. It how the transit is not only the place you move, but the whole ecosystem that comes with that movement. So this is Hang Thu uh, in, and how and they analyze this district to create different forms of mobility in addition to how to, to 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 be, to automobile, but also inter intersecting some natural conditions inside and imagine that the streets could be sometimes highly, highly open. And from this interaction, they create a catalog that, that transform not only one dimension street, but the whole street. Urban farming. 
number seven. Urban farming is really similar to the farm, but also uh, it, it, it's becoming a trend, especially in informal settlements. That is crazy, but in informal settlements, we are have a uh, lacking of food in most of the moment because of of of, uh, of poverty. So they are also using as a way to create community engagement, community power, and especially women power. So most of the urban farms in Kenya are lead, uh, are, are, are women's leaders, and they are transforming the spaces like they want the top right, uh, left, these type of landfill fields into new urban farms. Again, these are, we're not believing they, they can feed their kids with this food. But this is only one fragment of the equation. They're also building community, remediation the land, soil, the soil, and, and empowering, empowering the people. So your projects will be more than just the thing that the project do. So this is the vertical urban farming in Kibera. In Nairobi's Kibera neighborhood, residents are supported by international NGO, the Human Needs Project, are making possible what seems out of reach. They have ventured into urban farming. They had to find solutions to challenges, including a lack of proper sanitation and scarcity of water that make farming a difficult venture in Kibera. David Omari has adapted the soilless medium. He uses Paris, the volcanic rock. So we are using what we call the Western product, of which these are the things which come from the yogurt, those cups of the yogurt. So we are using it, we put in the humus, of which comes from the volcanic type of soil or a rock from my mind. So this one, we you know, it does what you want, some impunities. It's clear and it makes the work easier because you cannot grow some, some weeds. The use of hydroponic methods is helping Kibera's urban farmers maximize the space for bamboo harvest. They are funded by the World Food Program. International NGO, the Human Needs Project, supplies farmers with clean water for irrigation and other amenities. Urban farming is very important to people in the being set in informal settlement, given that an informal settlement is seen like a dumping site by anyone outside. And then being able to trace where the food is coming from, we believe it's very important for the community. Kibera is home to an estimated population of 250,000. Agriculture experts say urban farming provides more affordable crops since transportation costs are reduced. The Jason Wakan crops grown in Kibera should contain less contaminants. This informal sectors have poor economic quality. So, soil as a medium for production of crops polluted. And now we are avoiding this pollution, this hazard of uh, pollution to uh, to the produce that is coming from the farms. So one method is found in the soil as a medium of production. And therefore, uh, the farmers can consider soil as medium. As an ongoing drought hits countries in the Horn of Africa, some hope urban farming can help improve food security. So I, I, I want to be recognized something that is beautiful in this discussion is that the production of nature, I told you that with the production, the nature has been a tool to produce capitalist uh, segregation. But at the same time, there is a guy called Ignacio Jimenez from the University of Valencia. He said that we can also produce nature, we can produce new natural solutions. We can use uh, we can use this, we can use the sign to produce natural conditions inside the city. So three more. So this is bioretations in Denmark and how a single small urban space can be a form to retain water uh, through different tools. Sometimes you can use the soil or you can have, you can, sometimes you can use, uh, so, so with this type of, of, of things, or you're gonna have, sometimes you can use uh, architectural artifacts, like these umbrellas to retain water. So this is a whole, project to retain water and use this water retention as a way to build the landscape. So the landscape comes not from the beauty of the flowers, but from the beauty of the ecosystems. So how you create an ecosystem that creates beauty and that creates the landscape of the project. We have wetlands. So this is quite new. So the, the last 15 years, 
we're building wetland, wetlands inside the city. Uh, again, it's a way to control, to adapt to flooding in moments of climate change. You know that climate change have like two visions or three. You can mitigate it, like for example, reducing full fossil energy. You can uh, adapt to it, imagining that that will be flooded no matter what, and we do projects to manage this flooding. Or three, we can migrate. We can move out. That's our the three solutions so far. So there is a movie called The Day After Tomorrow. And it said it's basically we have to migrate from the north to the to the to the global south because this part will be plenty of water after when climate change when, when the climate change kicked out. So this is a system of water retention that transformed to a public project. Flood plains. Uh, so this is a seasonal project that also have the benefit of, of connecting community through that bridge that they connect the wealthy city with the suburban uh, underprivileged community that are on the other side. Uh, they were disconnected for a while in Jinhan City. And they created this huge pedestrian bridge, but also that managed these different levels of, of, of flooding and uses the floods and the water as a way to have community engagement. So this is elevated because sometimes the water is here, sometimes the water is below, depending of the season and the and depending of the yeah of the ways of the cities. And also it's a project that engages a lot with the beauty of uh, architectural design integrated with the urban projects. And finally we have mangroves. Uh, a mangrove is an, another example from mass Africa, in this case, the community of Gazi Bay. So what is really amazing is that they are dealing with something that is global. Globally, we know that the way we're treating the, the coast are hard, it be harmful for the, for the, for the cold seas. This is basically a, a model from, from, from Africa or from Miami. So they understand that that mangroves could be an, a wonderful tool to uh, protect uh, cities from the effects from the effects of, 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 of water floods, and they are producing different areas where mangroves can happen across the world to remediate coastal situation. So while this NGO is doing that at the global level, the community of Gasibe is doing that as a local level. So they understood very well that the mangroves can protect their community. So they create this community organization where they start understanding the importance of uh, the meeting new wahid or the, the mangroves and, and organize the community, especially women's organized to, to, to uh, create new forests of mangroves across the whole uh, Kenya to protect the whole the communities and their farms from, from coastal from uh, what if for coastal floods, from floods on the coast. And they have a very comprehensive catalog of different species or type of mangrove that happen across the coast to, to make that happen. But, but again, it's, it's beautiful how the leadership of this woman has to be created this very, very intricate system of agreements because there are people around the world going there to, to support then and the United Nations is providing resources to build this uh, massive uh, mangrove. So at the end, I've been cho I showed you that the natural based solution catalog have all of these uh, processes, functions, and benefits. Some of them have, have been included in my eleven examples that I showed you. There is another framework that I invite you to look at is the Ecology Agency of Barcelona, where Salvador Rueda is creating this systemic relations between the social cohesion, the efficiency of the metabolism, and the complexity of urban biodiversity, and how this works together to create a more sustainable environment, and that can happen within the city. Actually, this is Barcelona. But for me, the most important message here is to say that we are being in a, in a deep ecology that we are not egocentric as a member to control the world, looking the nature from a window, from a tree, but we belong to the nature and everyone, the, the, everything that we 
what we do affects the, uh, the natural and produce the nature and produce uh, equitable and sustainable nature or segregated nature. So this is something that Joseph French called foundational ecology. Psychology that found founded in the, our belief that we can be part of nature in a positive way. So that's it for today.